Welcome to Shop Talk Live, Fine Woodworking Magazine's bi-weekly podcast. I'm your host and Fine Woodworking Editor, Tom McKenna. Joining me today are Executive Art Director, Mike Pekovich. How are you guys? And Special Projects Editor, Matt Kenny. Hey guys, how's it going? Anyone know this, notice there's a change in Matt's title? He, uh, he got a little right. promotion, just a little one. So um, it's kind of a cool, cool little job where he's going to be doing... Um, how I describe it is a hybrid print slash digital position where he's going to be doing a, a lot more online stuff for us. Uh, and I'll still be loading him up with, uh, with print jobs. So it's a good thing. And uh, it's a testament to everything that Matt does for us. And it's all good. So yeah. congratulations, Matt. Thank you. New job, twice as much work, half as much pay. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So <laughs> before we get started, let me take care of some housekeeping. Remember to spread the word about Shop Talk Live by telling your friends via Twitter or Facebook, and you may even tell them in person. What a concept. Also, drop by our iTunes page and leave a comment and a generous star rating. If you're happy with the product, you can also find us at iHeartRadio. Next, don't forget to check our website to keep up with our exciting tool giveaway for Fine Woodworking's 40th anniversary. We're giving away 40 great tools, but the prizes change regularly. So what's the new prize of the week? You have to enter for each one. Um, This week's prize is the Lee Nielsen block plane that we had uh, announced uh, during the last episode. But uh, folks should keep a close look at what's coming up. Uh, We do have several big money prizes to offer in January. So, uh, you know, keep your eye out for that. To enter, go to findwoodworking.com slash 40 sweeps. That's the number 40. Again, that's finewoodworking.com slash 40 sweeps. For this prize, for the block plane, you must enter by Monday, January 4th. That's uh, this this Monday. Let's move on to uh, questions. Um, I'm probably going to kill this guy's name, but the first one comes from Matt Segan, Chegan, uh, whatever. His first name is Matt. Uh, he says, several weeks ago, I completed a Morris chair made with cortisone white oak. I stained the chair with WD Lockwood alcohol-based dye and applied two coats of Zinsser shellac thinned with alcohol. I noticed a few things during the finishing, and I can't figure out what caused them. During the staining and dyeing, there were small areas that looked almost like red paint had been splattered on the wood. Secondly, while applying the shellac, I noticed that it was drawing a lot of the dye out of the wood. Can you help? And I think Mike, uh, Mike has some really good advice here. Yeah, well, first off, those little dots of color you get if you're applying a dye are probably uh, come from like undissolved pigments in the dye. And once they hit the wood, they sort of kind of do their thing. So the first thing you should do when you're mixing up the dye, let it follow the directions, let it hang around long enough, and then strain it and you'll probably get rid of all those little pigments. That's probably where the spots came from. And then... One quick question. What do you use to strain it? Cheesecloth? Um, I think you buy those little paint strainers from the paint store. Okay. You know, those little fine... It looks like a little cone, but the bottom portion is sort of a really fine screen. Um, And then the second thing, so you have an alcohol-based dye, then you're wiping on shellac on top of that, and you're pulling up uh, the dye. That makes a lot of sense because... You know, alcohol is a solvent in shellac. So if you use the same uh, solvent solvent in your finish as you have in the dye, you're going to run into problems. So um, three solutions. Number one, if you use an alcohol-based dye, you can coat it with an oil-based finish, like a wiping varnish, Mm -hmm. no problem. If you want to use shellac over an alcohol-based dye, um, get a spray can of shellac. And, and spray on one coat of shellac on top of the dye, and then it should seal it well enough to where you're probably not gonna be pulling up a lot of dye after the fact if you wanna continue with the shellac finish on top of that. Now that works because when you spray it, you're not wiping it and pulling anything up? Exactly, right, you're sort of sealing it in place. Um, or you can use a water-based dye mm-hmm. in conjunction with shellac, which um, I think a lot of folks do. Uh, Water-based dyes are actually more light fast over time than alcohol-based dyes. The problem is they raise the grain a little bit. The water raises the grain. So if you do use a water-based dye, spritz the whole thing with water first, let it dry, sand the grain back down. That should minimize the amount of grain raising you get once you apply the water-based dye. So how do we help Matt? Does he have to start over again? What's, uh, you know, where he's at now? What are, does he have any good options left? No. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean. Um, he's got to start over. 
if it looks fine, if you didn't pull up enough dye to where you're overly streaky or anything, um, you're probably fine by the time you, you apply subsequent coats of shellac on top of the shellac or maybe from this point switch over to wiping varnish. That's fine as far as those little dots and stuff. Yeah. You could milk paint it and call it a Shaker Morris chair. <laughs> <laughs> That's rich. <laughs> um, you know, chances are those little dots and stuff, you might notice it at once you're going on, but unless they're really, really apparent, you know, you're probably going to finish this thing with a dark wax anyway, and it's really going to sort of get into the pores and pop the grain and maybe minimize any sort of minor color differences you've got yeah. on this thing. I just, you know, keep moving forward. Woodworkers are always more picky about the projects they make than the people around them. Mm -hmm. So you could just do the wife and or spouse or sweetheart check and show it to that person. And if they don't say anything about it, then just keep going, like Mike said. And don't point it out. Don't. Yeah, don't point it out. That yes. was <laughs> I've done that so many times. <laughs> yeah. Oh, you, you see, didn't see that. <laughs> did you see anything wrong with this chair, like those big splots of red? <laughs> well, to Matt's credit, uh, Matt uh, Segan, the writer, he did mention in the portion that I edited out that the splotches weren't that big a deal. So it sounds yeah. like he can just move on forward. Sure. So. Get yourself, because um, the Morris chair is going to have an upholstered seat and cushion, get some really crazy wild fabric. Yeah. Like and something you'd see in Greg Brady's room in the attic. Yes, and that's going to draw all the attention away from the finish. Marsha, yes. Marsha, Marsha. Yeah. All right, let's move on to question number two. This one comes from George Adams. George writes, I'm building a frame and panel. I'm, I'm sorry, let me start again. I'm building frame and panel doors for a bathroom medicine cabinet. Recently, Mike suggested MDF, while Matt, back around episode 47, described having to rebuild his cabinet doors because the MDF moved. What, what material do you recommend for a moist environment like a bathroom? Would you use something else for a living room? First, this is becoming like a Trekkie convention when people are mentioning things that were said in particular episodes. <laughs> it's like <laughs> real. <laughs> well, was it, the problem with my, he's, he's, he's referring to my kitchen cabinet doors. Uh, yeah. The first time I made them, I used uh, poplar for the rails and styles. An MDF for the frame uh, for the panel, and I glued it all together with glue in the grooves. Yes, um, and a lot of the doors were moving and cupping and uh, just not flat anymore after I made them. Yeah, um, and uh, I think you said that. Well, that's probably because you glued the MDF into the groove. Well, I surmise that I did my whole kitchen at MDF, and I glued everything in. Um, I think I used poplar as well. I think you use soft maple. Maybe you use soft maple. I did about 30 something doors total in my kitchen. I think I have two that twisted just a little bit. Uh, yeah, I think it's from the fact that I use poplar and maybe the MDF. But um, I the second time I made them, I used plywood and soft maple, did not glue the panels in, and still some of them moved. Okay. And I was much more careful milling up only using quarter sawn stock for the rails and the styles, much more careful milling things, letting it sit, milling mm -hmm. it, letting it sit. And stuff still moved, hmm. you know? So um, what was the question? Does he have another option other than MDF for a moist environment? You know, I, you know, I, it probably sounds like he shouldn't, certainly shouldn't glue the, the panels in place and maybe. No, just do a true floating panel. <clears throat> Yeah. And let it move and expand and contract like it wants to. And maybe. you can use anything. Maybe I mean, I mean for cope and stick joinery, I, that's, I do glue the panel in. For cope and stick, yeah. I didn't for, use cope and uh, Just for extra strength. If mm -hmm. you're doing full mortise and tenon joinery, there's no reason to um, glue it. If you don't glue it in there, um, you probably want to pre-finish the panel if you're painting it. Yes. Before you uh, glue your door up. That way, when it shrinks, you're not going to have that little line where there's no paint there but it sounds like i mean he's probably doing natural wood with you know no paint because he asked about a finish and not you know so really i would think uh poly if you pre-finish the panel do mm -hmm. poly and then use poly on the rest of it we, we once had this question in the q a department when i was doing the q a department and i believe it was poly on the outside was the answer wipe on you know like a polyurethane and then like shellac on the inside if you wanted to hmm. and as long as you let it cure uh you know like 9 months before you put it in the bathroom <laughs> 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 no just you know wipe it on let it dry properly hmm. and then and it goes and uh it should be fine 
Or we could be yeah. completely overthinking this. Do what you want to do. It's going to be fine. Yeah. yeah. And then when it falls apart in 10 years, just make a new one. Or call Matt. Call Mike. Mike's not going to say that. Let it go. <laughs> well, and speaking of uh, cabinet doors and such going wonky, it's time for some smooth moves. What would you do with the brain if you That's had That's right. I think, uh, I think we all have a, a smooth move uh, this episode. What, uh, what do you have there, Matt? Uh, did I say I had a smooth move? I thought you did. Oh, you I have can't. a smooth move every week, every every <laughs> every episode. Yeah, I recently accepted a promotion at my job. <laughs> Maybe you should do a jig for that. <laughs> Bada boom! All right, why don't Mike go first? I think he knows what it is off the top of uh, his head. Yeah, I have a I have a really fresh smooth move. It happened um, last night in the shop, and it's uh, it's a typical smooth move in that um, I'm, I was doing various stuff and I needed a little scrap of wood. I needed to bandsaw a little strip off of the scrap of wood. I found a little short, cut some, uh, ripped off a strip in order to have a backing block for when I was cutting some bridle joints and some door frames. Um, and then I went to tenon the other portions of the drawer frames. So I got my dado blade set up, got the fence set up, got it dialed in to cut my tenons exactly the right thickness, exactly the right length. I go to find, I'm doing two doors, so I'm looking for my four rails that are tenon and I only find three. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Boom. <laughs> and then I go over to the bandsaw on that little short that I had ripped a strip off as a backing block for my uh, tenoning jig was indeed the fourth rail. Uh. So here I am. My table saw is already set up and dialed in for my tenons. I don't want to mess that up. So basically I don't have a table saw and I need to create a fourth piece exactly the same dimension. Fortunately, I had some stock that was already playing to the correct dimension. So, okay, I can deal with this. So, um, and this was actually really cool. So how do you go about exactly duplicating a part without a table saw? So you can't rip, you can't cross cut. Um, so I ripped it on the bandsaw, slightly oversized, hit it on my hand plane until I was dead on. Went to my chop saw, cut it just slightly oversized, went to my shooting board, uh, with my awesome miter plane and shot with my shooting board plane and shot the end square and exactly to the right length. So um, so that was kind of cool. I got to break out my mad ninja hand tool skills. It's just how your great, great grandpappy would have done it. Yeah. So <laughs> on, on one hand, I'm glad that I had those skills available to be able to match a piece without breaking down my table saw. On the other hand, I'm glad I don't have to do that to every single piece <laughs> of furniture that I make. So, um, yeah, so I was able to, with some uh, hand tools, get that fourth piece going again, get all my tenons cut without having to reset that up. And um, and it worked out well. But it was one of those things where it's like, oh, no, I did all this because and all these pieces were four pieces exactly the same dimension as if this is some like magical thing and there's no way to replicate another piece exactly to these other three, mm -hmm. not having gone through all those multiple machine setups to get there. It's like, no, just get another piece and make it the same size. It's okay. Here's a, actually a point uh, that I'll just, in, because you said um, you're glad you didn't have to, you wouldn't, didn't have to do that with every piece, you know, uh, cut it a little oversized, shoot it, et cetera. Right. Well, when I uh, first learned to make furniture, uh, I learned to make things like rails with tenons on them a completely different order than, say, what you're describing. Because the way that you made prep that piece was because you were going to do the table saw and cut your tenons there. Right. So they have to be exactly the right length, right? Right. Length, thickness. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. So if in, a, like if in an exclusive hand tool shop, you actually don't really con are concerned about the exact length because you will square up one end, cut the tenon, and then measure from the tenon for the shoulder to shoulder hmm. distance because that's what's really critical on the, all your rails. Is that the shoulder to shoulder distance is the same. Right. Once you have that shoulder to shoulder distance, then you can cut your next tenon, and then you can just sort of cross cut it the tenon down, and the tenon length then doesn't have to be exact. Right. It can be a little short. Yep. So there's like a, a different process of thinking yep. about and it. And while process. all that's going on, I've moved on to my next piece of furniture. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I'm, I'm thinking that Mike missed a classic opportunity by saying that he was missing the fourth rail. 
I was hoping he would say he was missing He's the third rail. Thankfully. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think Mike gets that joke. Is that like subway humor? Subway or humor, yeah. Okay. And potty humor. That's bad. Potty is humor, potty is humor? it? Really? Yeah, that, that lady's going to write us again. Uh-oh. Well, <laughs> I'll read the letter this time. <laughs> yeah. That's Tom McKenna making the potty jokes. Anyway, I, I have a, a smooth move that uh, occurred a couple weeks ago where I was uh, doing an inlay, and, and it's something that happened to me once before, so I should have known better, but I had... When I excavate for the inlay, I try to make a tight fit, you know, so I, you know, I shouldn't be able to, you know, pry the thing out. So I get it nice and tight and then tap it in. And um, for this cutting board I was making, I made the inlay extra thick and I was trying to get it to seat. And for some reason, it just wasn't going in. So I used my wooden mallet, didn't go in as far as I thought it should. Then I busted out my bigger hammer <laughs> 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 and I put a block of wood over it. I started hitting it with my framing, uh, my framing hammer, and um, lo and behold, I cracked the darn thing. And so I was the in a panic. The inlay or the cutting the board? The inlay. Oh, okay. <laughs> that would have been bad. <laughs> but uh, I was fortunate in this case because the inlay was thick. I thought, well, I'm not going to pull it out now. I'll see. I'll let it dry, and then I'll, I'll plane it down. If I need to remove it, I will. But fortunately, once I got a plane flush, the crack, you know, it's visible to me. I know exactly where it is, but it didn't. You know, it wasn't a complete split where I was going to have a, a gaping wound in the middle of the inlay. But like I said, it's one of those things where I did it before and I did it again. So I've got to get this inlay thing down or I'm going to drive myself crazy. Um, so is that your uh, your whole that, story? That's my whole story and I'm sticking to it. Well, make sure you point out the crack to uh, whoever you give that cutting board to. Well, it's, I gave is this it to, the axe one? Uh, yeah, I gave it to the to the couple this weekend. And <laughs> I was looking at it when uh, the guy was holding it up, and I kept looking at it. I'm like beating right on the way the crack is. Like, man, I hope they don't notice. I hope they don't notice. You turned around, and then the wife went, do you think he saw the crack? No, you know, hey, I, this is one of the first times um, that I did not point out the flaw to people. And so right. nobody was aware except me. And I think people heard me cuss, but... <laughs> um, you know, that's nothing new when, when I'm in the shop, you know, occasional... Or at work, or the yeah, grocery store. Occasional or potty mouth uh, happens. But. but now our six podcast listeners know as well. So hopefully... Yes. You know. <laughs> Three of those are Deami, too. <laughs> <laughs> one on his phone, one on his iPod, you know, one on his laptop. Uh, all right. Um, so my smooth move, which I now remember, is uh, I'm making a box right now that has six drawers in it. Yes. And uh, I thought that the drawer fronts were going to be made from the same material as the case piece, which is this really dramatic-looking madrone. Nice, with all the grain lined up for all six drawers. Yes, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. So the grain was going to, yeah, I had a piece wide enough to go from the top to the bottom of three Perfect. rows, and everything, just beautiful dramatic grain. And so when I was making the drawer fronts, what I did was um, – because I wanted to have that grain match even better than if I were to cut apart the board with a, um, like a really precisely with my table saw to cut the drawer fronts out. Right. You know, so I said, all right, well, I'm, I resawed off a veneer from the, the, the full board, and I set that aside to later become the drawer fronts. Got it. Or the, the, the uh, veneer. False, the, the lipped front for the dovetails. Not a lip. but uh, So what I did was once I cut that off, I took the rest of the board, cut out my drawer fronts, cut through dovetails on the front of the drawers, yep. and then glued back on that veneer. The lapped portion. Why, why are you calling it lapped? I don't understand. Well, uh, it's, it's your false front for your fake dovetail drawer. I mean, I'm not, I'm trying <laughs> They're to not think. fake dovetails. No, I know. I'm sorry. I'm just, I'm not trying to be, you know. Uh, sarcastic. I'm just saying you you sawed off a portion, you did through dovetails, and then you glued it back on. Yeah, it was exactly what I said. So what do you call that portion? I was just calling I that the, the, the lift or the lap portion. Front? It's, it's not, not really a false, false front. front, but fake it's, front? it's the fake dovetail portion of the, okay. of the program. Whatever. No. All right, let's, okay. It's Matt's third rail. <laughs> I was just trying to clarify. <laughs> We're just giving Mike a hard time. Um, so, I, I, so I did that, and I glued them all back on. And ah, perfect, they looked great. And then I noticed one of the top drawers, I glued the veneer on the wrong way. So the grain did not all line up nice and pretty like it was supposed to. That's called asymmetry. 
Yeah. <laughs> you, was it upside down? I think that I glued the back on so that it was the front. Ah, okay. Yeah, because so the grain, so the grain was actually running in the opposite direction as the rest of the drawers. Like the rest of the drawers kind of had an upward. So the wrong face in. Yes. Okay. Yeah, so you yeah. couldn't just turn the drawer upside down and have everything line up right. No, and have a drawer bottom on the top. Right. So they pull it up. It's like, oh, this drawer's got a lid on it. That's fun. Awesome. <laughs> no, but any, but um, that's the mother-in-law drawer. You put it in the bathroom and load it up with marbles. So when they're sneaking <laughs> through <laughs> all your drawers, <laughs> sounds like Mike has done that. <laughs> <laughs> so. Um, but anyways, I wasn't entirely sold on using that madrone as the actual visible drawer front. Right. And I decided after, not only because of that, but also because I just wasn't sold on it, that I'm going to veneer over it. So that's my solution. Cool. So I think I'm going to use a commercial veneer, really thin commercial veneer to go over that. Uh, and it'll solve my problems, I hope. Cool. Oh, milk it? paint. Milk paint. Well, actually, Mike and I photoshopped up a, I took a picture, a front view of the box, and we photoshopped in uh, a simulated milk color milk paint color right. on some of the drawers I thought, you know, and it just didn't look right. So gonna... I think contrasting wood for the drawer faces will be really nice. Yes. And no one will know it was a mistake. Yeah. No. All right. Let's get back to some questions. Uh, this one comes from Andreas Zenker. And uh, he writes, recently Matt talked about planing thin strips with a custom plane jig. I have some slats of ash walnut and rosewood that I'm planing to thicknesses of eighth inch to a quarter inch. For the quarter inch ones, I used an MDF sled to run the boards through my planer, and I used double-sided tape to stick the slats down to the sled. Will this work for thinner slats? Do you have any other tips for thin stock planing? And Matt, uh, before we, we started, Matt had some, some good ideas, so I'd let, uh, let him jump in. Yes, uh, <laughs> I think. But you said before we get started. I was like, get started doing what? Um, yeah. So well, now that I th the, when I first saw this question, I thought he was asking about making veneer. But I, I think my answer still mm. applies. One, do not tape it down to a piece of MDF because if it gets thinner than say, when you start to get close to an eighth of an inch, you try to pull that back up off uh, double stick tape or two sided tape or whatever that it's called double right. stick tape. It's not. It's, it's gonna, gonna crack. Yeah, it's gonna crack apart. Um, so. One thing you can do, let's say that he just wants these really thin boards and he's not going to use them as veneer. Then what I would do is uh, as you're, as you're resawing them, you joint your face that goes against the fence, make a cut. Joint the face again on the remaining board, make another cut. So each time you're cutting a piece off, you end up with one face that's jointed and the other face that's band sawn. Right. And if your bandsaw is set up well, then there's really shouldn't be too much roughness there. It should be fairly smooth. And what you can then do is clamp that down and plane away from the clamp. So okay. if you make the slats a little bit longer than you want them to be, um, you can plane away from the clamp and you, know, you still have plenty of usable wood there. He doesn't mention that he's resawing, though, does he? So, but you can do the same thing uh, even if it's not resawing. If they just start out with really thin boards, you can just clamp it down at the back and plan away from yeah, it. Yeah, he, he, one, one item that I did edit out was that he has just started resawing. Oh, that's and right. And has learned the wonders of it. Yes, but, yes, uh, yes, yes. I didn't think it was relevant, but I guess I was wrong. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, that's right. I did, now I recall. So he is resawing. And uh, so you can do that if you want to just keep them as thin boards. And what I would do even possibly is uh, if you want them all a consistent thickness, say an eighth of an inch, after you – so you make a you, – when you first joint the board, take your marking gauge and – do a line at an eighth of an inch all the way around it. Resaw it proud of an eighth of an inch, and then you can work down to that line okay. and get a consistent thickness, and then just repeat that process for each successive one. If you're going to make veneers, then what I would do is uh, first I would prob personally I would probably do uh, not probably I would do slip matching as opposed to book matching. Right. Um, and the reason is it has to do with the grain orientation of, uh, 
if the grain runs in one direction on the top face of a board, it runs in the opposite direction on the bottom face. So when you book match something, you actually end up with grain running in opposite directions. Right at that glue line there. At that yeah. glue line. So yeah. you, you can't run that through a planer because you'll get tear out no matter which way you do it. So, But if you slip match, which means you just slide them off to the side rather than open them up like a book, you end up with all the grain running in the same direction on the top face. Right. So what I would do is... Again, resaw joint, resaw joint, resaw joint. So every piece that you make has a jointed face. Then uh, you can edge glue those all together, for example, if you're making like a panel, and then glue them down with a jointed face down on whatever your substrate is. And then, lo and behold, it's thick enough to run through the planer. Yeah, or a hand plane. Or a hand much plane. Easier. Much yep. easier. Yeah, so I would do that. Um if you do want a book match, then what you can do is you're not going to you're not going to have two faces that are jointed to glue down. Right. Uh, yeah. So you're going to have to go back to the uh, the trick I just described where you clamp it down at the back and hand plan mm -hmm. away from it. But all I would do there is get it good enough to glue down. And it doesn't really have to be perfect, yep. but get it good enough to glue down, glue it down and then flatten the two by hand so that you can work on either side of the glue line. Cool. Okay. Well, I think Matt has spoken enough. Or get a, get a drum sander. <laughs> <laughs> That's a, Matt's a two-thirds time is up. Yes, his red light is beeping. <laughs> yeah, I, I spoke for over half of that answer. <laughs> that was ugly. Um, well, this one, this one will make it all up. Uh, the, the next question comes from Jerry Kamasa. Uh, he writes, I love the design of the coffee table on the cover of the latest issue of Fine Woodworking. That's our February uh, 2016 issue. Uh, he says, I'd really like to build it, but I have two questions. What's your opinion about mixing furniture styles within a room and other pieces in the room where the table will live are in cherry? Would it be foolish to make the Limbert table out of cherry? And uh, I'm going to throw this right toward Mike. Well, the answer to the first part of that question is um, arts and crafts furniture. It's really a pretty, it's a pretty inclusive term. It really encompasses a, a broad range of furniture styles and makers, multinational. I mean, a lot of us, when we think of arts and crafts furniture, really what comes to mind first is stickly furniture, but that is really just a really small part of arts and crafts. So really there's sort of an eclectic nature to the whole arts and crafts movement. So you can mix and match different styles of arts and crafts furniture as much as you want. I think that's part of the charm of the style. Mm -hmm. In fact, you know, sort of like an entire room of, you know, J.C. Penny knockoff stickly furniture to me is kind of boring. But a bunch of flea market finds with a couple nice pieces or you make a Morris chair and you combine it with some other oddball things here and there, anything from Gothic furniture to even mid-century modern can really work. I mean, depending on your personal taste yeah. and style. So uh, go ahead and have at it. I'd just say, you know, if you like the piece, make it and put it in your house. Yeah. And if it looks good to you, fine, and everybody else has to live with it. So Exactly. There. <laughs> and then the other question, okay, this limber table, making this out of cherry, uh, instead of the white oak that was um, that Kevin Rodell made it in the article, um, I think that's a, a bigger question. And it really brings into the question of when we're choosing woods for furniture, a lot of times we're just thinking in terms of color. What color do I want this piece to be? When really wood itself, um, there's, you know, each wood species has a very specific character, independent, um, and in addition to its color. So in this case, you know, arts and crafts furniture, we see a lot of quarter sawn white oak used in arts and crafts furniture. And I think for good reason, because it's it's very simple furniture, not a lot of adornment, big, broad faces and planes on the furniture, and the white oak, number one, with that really poppy ray fleck to sort of give it a graphic quality, but also the really straight grain of the quarter sawn oak also gives it some order to the piece. So certain types of furniture, arts and crafts furniture specifically, it really... Is, is depends on the type of wood that you're making it out of. So uh, in this case, taking something that looks great in quarter sun white oak and making it out of cherry, I think you're changing the nature. Mm -hmm. it, it reminds me of, um, I think it was Greg Paolini had did a, an arts and crafts bookcase so yes. many years ago. And I don't know um, when, when or where the decision was made to do it in cherry, but 
it's a very different looking piece if you imagine what it would look like in quarter and white oak. You know, the cherry just sort of fell flat. I think, I think you're going to hurt Greg's feelings. No, 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 no. <laughs> uh, I was not going to bring up that piece specifically <laughs> as an example of an arts and crafts piece made well, in cherry. Let's, let, so yeah. let's, let, let's think about it this way, though. Because what you're saying, I agree with. And if you were to choose, say, flat sawn cherry to make that, uh, make the uh, Rodell coffee table, yes. I think that would be a, a disaster. Mm-hmm. But what if you were able to get a, lots of nice riffs on cherry? In which case, the grain would be very straight and quiet with that. I think that would certainly help a lot. Mm-hmm. Where even, you know, even rift and quarter sun cherry, so really straight grain. So then you're getting at least half of the, the visual structure the oak is providing with a quarter sun. And the other figure. half is the ray fleck? And the other half would be that ray fleck. So right? then when you yeah. do your finish, you could just mix in some mica and just. <laughs> Give it a little pizzazz <laughs> or milk paint or milk paint. No. <laughs> so no, but I agree yeah, with it, Mike that that, yeah. that uh, you you can't when you see a piece of furniture if it's well done the wood that was selected to make it is just as much of the, as of the design as the actual shape and proportions and parts you know that yes. and if you just you can't always just switch out woods mm-hmm. willy-nilly and it's not it's just it's not the same piece anymore right. it yeah, becomes it's very true. different it's true i mean when we get um gallery submissions on our online gallery for folks who who've gone out out of their way to make a piece in the magazine they they choose a different wood sometimes it doesn't work because they've picked a starkly different um uh, wood than the maker did in the magazine and and it's you know i think there's a lot of thought that goes into the design and picking a wood that works well and if you stray from it sometimes it falls down yeah i mean i've talked about this a little bit in the past but the notion of um, the more woods you work with the more you become familiar with them and really understand the nature of those woods i think the more effective you can design with wood in mind i think it's it's always tough when you just sort of have a piece on paper. Oh, I like this table. I'm going to make it. What kind of wood should I make it out of? You know, mm-hmm. I think the wood you're making it out of should have already informed that design before you even start drawing. I think. Yeah, I mean, absolutely. When I design stuff, I always think one of the first things I think about is what species of wood am I going to make it from? Yes. And how. Am I going to be able to? How will the grain and the shape of the grain and the in the and the width of the grain and the pore size and all of that? How will it affect the the overall uh, success of what I've designed? Right. I mean, because a lot of like, for example, a lot of what I make is very clean and modern uh, in design, which is why I more often than not choose a very tightly closed grain wood that's riff sawing. Because the straight lines in in that smooth, clean surface uh, re- reinforces the overall design rather than right. competes with it. Right. Yeah. Well, that means I should uh, I shouldn't have bought that truckload of maple. <laughs> <laughs> Why not? Why? <laughs> no, it's funny because I, I when I get when I have an, a, an opportunity to buy lumber, I do it, you know, oh. especially when it's a good deal. So I have a big old pile of maple that I'm trying to use up. That I'll be uh, making a living room set out of, oh. <laughs> but it's well. just a different approach, you know. I mean, I'm I wouldn't do, I wouldn't make an arts and crafts piece using maple the maple that I have. That would be know? an utter disaster. That would be it yeah. Would be maple would be nasty. terrible for arts and crafts furniture, except for that maple dining table we ran a few years <laughs> back. That was great. That was arts and crafts. Long, long time ago. Uh, and except well, for this before one, our time, except for that one guy listening in Minnesota that just finished his arts and crafts maple dining table. <laughs> Yours is beautiful. He used curly. <laughs> Yours is gorgeous. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's uh, let's move on. Um, this question is timed perfectly for our uh, January in New England. It's from Kevin Manley. Uh, Kevin lives in Vermont, and he says, "I have the opportunity to set up a small shop in our detached garage, not too dissimilar from Matthew Teague's shop in issue one sixty. This is one of those old 1920s New England one-car garages that have the sloped concrete floors and drain in the middle. The floor is cracked, the windows are busted, and the siding is rotting in some areas. (laughs) Sounds great. (laughs) I can't imagine why they want to let you just use it for a shop. (laughs) I'm going to put the effort and money in to insulate the space and to pull 60 amps of power out there, among other things. 
but I also want to be able to work during the cold months. Have any suggestions on how to control the climate and temperature in a New England garage without spending a ton on electricity? And, did, he, and, did he say he is going through the effort to insulate the space? Yes. Okay. Yes. yes. Um, which was a good start. Um, but, you know, both you and Matt, Mike, you and Matt work in garage spaces. I work in a, in a basement that doesn't get too many swings in, in temperature or um, humidity levels. So um, you guys have experience with, uh, with this kind of stuff. What, what did you do with yours, Mike? Well, I have a detached two-car garage. And so when I first got it, I called up my gas company. They came and put a direct vent propane heater mounted to the wall with a big old tank on the outside. Thought, sweet, this is great. Fired that thing up. Burned through like a whole 100-gallon tank in a month. <laughs> <laughs> and the shop never got above like 45 degrees. It was like brutal. So it basically went unheated for years and years until I broke down, cleared out the shop, insulated everything, including the floor, the walls, the ceiling, and uh, retrofitted the garage door so I can really have um, leak-proof doors. Mm -hmm. And I even have... Um, double insulated windows as well, little storm windows that I tack in for the winter time. Once I did that, that same heater works awesome. And I can keep that to a minimum of 50 degrees, 24 hours a day, you know, 12 months out of the year. And then when I want to turn it up, it, it warms up really quick. And I, I burn through, you know, maybe a tank, a tank and a half mm -hmm. of propane for the entire year living in Connecticut. So um, really, the ins for me, um, insulation was a key. And if you talk to any of our, our home building guys over at Find Home Building down the hall, they're all going to say gaps are Sealant, even yeah. more critical than getting everything insulated. So make sure everything is gap free. Um, and then the type of heat uh, you choose, I think it's important as well. Matt, we were talking earlier, Matt made a good point that if you get one of those little kerosene heaters, anything that doesn't vent to the outside, you're really building up mm -hmm. moisture in that space as you're burning that fuel, and that can cause moisture issues as yeah, well. And, and that's what Matt, this, uh, the writer, had mentioned that um, he was uh, planning on getting a kerosene heater, uh -huh. but had brought yeah. up the, the humidity uh, issues that Matt had brought up. Yeah, because in my, my shop, my garage shop's attached to the house, and m most of it's below grade. So... Um, it usually doesn't get too terribly cold. You know, the coldest it will normally get is around 40 degrees. Mm -hmm. it's, uh, it's currently uninsulated and unheated, <laughs> <laughs> which makes it pretty uncomfortable, actually. And uh, But I've been very hesitant to uh, heat it because I have garage doors, which are old, and, and uh, there's lots of um, leaks, you right. know, and so... I know that I first need to do is replace those garage doors uh, with better doors that are sealed properly. Yep. And then I'm going to wait and see whether or not just naturally it'll stay about 50 degrees. Because 50 degrees, actually, I can handle. Yes. It's not bad. Yeah. Yeah. You know. So, but um, if you use one of those little, like a one of the job site heaters that hooks up to a propane tank or something like that, uh, actually, there's reasons why they say, one, it should be, you should use those in a well-ventilated area. Right. <laughs> <laughs> and two, the, also uh, the moisture is a problem. I recently broke down and bought a, uh, a little space heater that would heat like 400 square feet that r would run off the propane tank that I use on my grill. And I was all excited and I was going to hook it up and use it. And then one of the guys, uh, home building actually does, they're not down the hall, they're right next to us. And over the cube from yeah, you. Over the cube yeah. from me, over the cube wall from me is my friend Patrick McComb. And uh, he said, you know, you don't want to use that. And the reason is the, the moisture, uh, that it's really bad, especially in a insulated space. Okay. Introducing that kind of moisture is really bad, uh, so don't do it. And... Um, what type of heat you could use. He says he doesn't want to use a lot of electricity, but listen, you're paying for heat, whether it's gas or whatever, kerosene, what have you, um, would be to get an electric heater and use that. Okay. Because then that doesn't need to be vented outside. Any sure. type of gas, any type of gas heater needs to be vented outside. Uh, mm -hmm. And the ones that aren't vented outside are at, truly meant for job sites that are like, you know, the, the openings are covered with bisqueen or uh, right. plastic, 
you know, so. And it's um, a temporary heat source, it's really. It's a temporary heat source. Yeah. It's not a permanent heat source. So, um, have you thought about a pellet stove? I know that still has to be vented outside, but you don't need a big duct for for that kind of a device. Yeah, that's a nice dry heat. That's fine. A wood uh, stove, pellet stove. Yeah, I haven't gotten that far because I need to replace my garage doors. Yeah. What I was, a lot of folks, especially in our neck of the woods, tend to look towards a wood stove as a, as a cheap way to get some heat in there. What I like about having the propane um, is that I can maintain a constant right. minimum level yep. in there, especially if I'm not going to be in there for a day or two. I'm not going to be lighting a fire or something like that. Yeah. You know, the thermostat's kind of a nice thing to have. Mm-hmm. Yes, yeah. Yeah, that's the the big problem with like a, some type of wood stove is that when you're not using it, it just gets really cold, and then uh, it takes a while to heat up. And then, you know, how often am I in my shop for eight or nine hours, you know? Yeah. Not very often. Well, what's cool about the the pellet versions is that they're they're self feeding, and so you can uh, you can dump the pellets in, and they have, I don't know what it's called, an impeller or some sort that you know yeah, slowly that little, cranks that the, little hopper, that, the stuff. Yeah, the yeah. hopper. It's like um, a hamster feeder. Exactly. Yes. They look like hamster pellets. It's yes. kind of funny. But. Our, our California listener, he's thinking, well, on like the three days a year, it's only sixty degrees. I just don't work in the shop that day. Dude, I go surfing. No, <laughs> sixty degrees. <laughs> We've been lucky so far that it hasn't been that cold. Yeah, so no, far. Good. Yeah, we had a we had a brutal winter last year. So let's yeah. uh, let's move on. Um, one thing I don't think I did yet is is say Happy New Year. I mean, it's January first, <clears throat> and uh, we're starting 2016. And we thought a fun thing to do would be to talk about woodworkers New Year's resolutions. And I think uh, since Matt came up with the idea, I'm going to throw it at him first. Oh. I, I resolve I'm going to make 52 boxes in 52 weeks. That's last year. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, I what I'm going to do, one thing I want to do when I get done with the 52 boxes thing in April is the first thing I'm going to try to do is make maybe two or three pieces of furniture where I take everything that I learned in that design, that sort of my own aesthetic that I've been developing and apply it to full-size furniture. Hmm. So uh, I've got like a wall cabinet in mind, a sideboard, and then something else, you know. Cool. I don't know what, uh, but some other type of piece of furniture. Those are some vague resolutions. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, you know, I came up with the idea to do this, but it's not, I mean, I had any specific resolutions in mind. It'd be a really good idea to write a book about the 52 boxes. Oh, yeah. I don't think we that would get... Look, we should look into that. We should look into that. I don't think that would get done, though, in a year. No. No. So that would be fun if I could write a book about the, the boxes and some other stuff. But um, what else could I do for a New Year's resolution, guys? Be nice to people. Be nice. <laughs> be nice to people. <laughs> Stop the potty mouth. That's exhausting. <laughs> I'm nice to some people. <clears throat> My kids. <laughs> That's a good thing. How about you, Mike? What are your uh, uh, resolute resolutions? I was trying to think about this. I was thinking, okay, I'm going to try to spend, you know, get out to the shop every single day in the next year. But I kind of already do that. Yeah. So that's like. Your wife makes you do that. But I think the reason why I said that, the reason why I said, oh, I want to get out of the shop every day, what I really meant was. Um, even though I'm in the shop every day, a lot of times it has to do with article work, tool tests, prepping for classes is a big one because I'm making up jigs and mock-ups and all that kind of stuff, doing commission work. And as much time as I spend in the shop, I spend a very relatively small proportion of that time working on things that I truly want to be working on. Original designs, you know, funky things that really get to the heart of why I like to woodwork. So I think like something I would aim for is to at least have a piece in progress that's just, you know, a spec piece, something original going on continuously throughout the year. So, you know, in the midst of doing all these other things, at least have something on the back burner and not, you know, sacrifice my entire time to other concerns involving woodworking that aren't quite hitting the mark for me because that's the easiest thing to let go by the wayside are those little spec pieces that really don't have a meaning. You don't have room in your house for them. Nobody wants them. No one's asking you to make those. 
And those are the easiest ones that, well, I'll put that off till later, but really those are the most important things for me to be working on. So I think it's just to always have something fun going on along with the billion other things that are going on um, that actually pay the bills. When I hear that, what I, what I hear is Mike wants more me time in the show. I need a little more me time. He needs to work on me. I I want some time to work on me. (laughs) (laughs) It's Matt breaking it down for us all. Actually, I I do have a resolution because I've been meaning to do this uh, and I still haven't done it. I thought the red light went off already. (laughs) No, come on now. We got, listen, she said I spoke for at least half the time. We got, I got a, that's like a challenge now. I got to get the half the time. I want to get my, <laughs> did you know I have a what, website, Tom? No, tell us about it. <laughs> so on my website, actually, I have the option to have a store and I want to get my store up and running. That's awesome. My, and of course, we get a percentage now that you're advertising with us. <laughs> <laughs> that's a good part of it. Well, I'll, right? actually, I'll actually be selling Taunton goods and products so like the laptop that, that computer that no one ever uses it's going in my store <laughs> <laughs> let's keep an eye on that um, my resolution is pretty simple and it's um one of my issues in terms of my woodworking is i don't have great tool storage so my goal within the next probably in the in this winter is to build a wall rack for all of my hand tools and get them off my bench and off my table saw and off my band saw. Because one of the things that really bogs me down is whenever I want to go to work, I have to move stuff. And then I have to move it from one thing to another to gain access. Yeah. It's just a pain in the butt. And um, I just want to get myself organized, consolidate my feces, so to speak, and um, get it all together. It's funny Again, how just you're, those... <laughs> see, and Now I know it's not me that makes the potty jokes. <laughs> There's no potty. It's amazing there. how those taking care of those little inconveniences really affects the quality of the work you do and the quality of the time that you spend yeah. in your shop. Yeah, I mean, hey. just trying to find uh, my marking gauge uh, a couple of weeks ago, I was like, where the hell did I put it? Yeah. <laughs> you know, here's like, since you've got a basement shop and you need storage, here's a storage solution for a basement shop. I don't think has ever been in a woodworking magazine. Oh. And we've never had it sent in every other day here. There might, might be a reason. Yeah. If you take all your old pill bottles <laughs> and you screw the cap to the bottom of the joist in your basement, then you can put miscellaneous nuts and bolts in the pill bottle and then just screw it back to the cap and it just hangs from your joist. That's not new. <laughs> Actually, I don't have that many pill bottles. I'm fortunate that way. I was being mildly, mildly sarcastic. You know, but it is funny. I did. I remember when I did Methods of Work, and I, I can't remember if it was one that I had seen or one that I had seen in the archives, but uh, some guy had taken some coffee cans and screwed them to the joist in the same fashion and put the lids on them, and it was kind of like, all right, what are you doing there? The yeah, house, weird. Like, I, we moved When you into... take the lid off, doesn't everything fall out? Uh... Just like Mike's upside-down drawer? Well, oh, I mean, the, the the can was the can. was screwed. Yeah. That makes and no then sense. The lid. Makes no yeah. sense. No, that's completely. That's, that's got to be the, wrong. No, he must have done it the opposite way. <laughs> it's all ba- me. The basement in our house, there's this little sort of uh, workbench built into the wall, and underneath there's probably twenty or thirty mason jars with the lids, yes. you know, screwed. Ah, that must be what to I'm the underside of the top, and and you just they look like all these little cool. They look like um like an old TV set, all the little tubes, you know, yes. hanging down. Amen. Yeah, well, we'll have to have. Uh, There's that. That's one of. The, that's probably the most popular tip that we get. Mm-hmm. And the second one is some variation on how to cut a, a slot in a dowel, <laughs> or how to make yes. a dowel, <laughs> or but how to make a dowel with a how table to cut, saw. How to cut circles? That's another good one. But the best meso- methods of work tip of all time: you nail a shoe to the wall. Yes. <laughs> nail a shoe to the and wall. You put Stick your stuff in it. it. Yeah, it's <laughs> awesome. It may smell a little rank, but you know, otherwise, all is good. Because I've got 80 old shoes sitting around. <laughs> yes. Gonna... But what's in there? I think it was a paintbrush or a screwdriver or a chisel just like sticking out of the shoe in the wall. It's awesome. All right. We, I think we have time for one more question. Um, this one is from Joe Tomeo or Tomeo. And uh, Joe says, I have several reclaimed oak boards that were used for trim and attached with a nail gun. I'm having trouble removing the nails without destroying the wood. Can you shed some light? And Matt had some really cool uh, tips that he gleaned from his friend, uh, friends over in home building again. Yes, yeah, so Patrick McComb again taught me this trick. When you have, because uh, we, Patrick's helped me a lot in my house, and you pull down trim, and the nail comes with it. 
And he's, he's always told me, never, never, never pull the nail out back through the face or the show side of the trim where, you know, the, the, what you see when you put it up on the wall. Always turn it around and pull the nail out from the back because if you pull it out from the front, you're going to make the hole bigger. That and also I try to bang the nail out from the back mm-hmm. forward creates this quarter size lift of paint, this disc yes. of paint that pops off and then you have right. to... Nice. But if you pull it out from the back, you don't damage the paint and that hole stays the same size and then you can just reuse the hole again. And uh, so if he can at all possibly do that, that's what he should do. But I don't know. He may have these giant, uh, you know, six inch thick things with nails down in them. Right? I don't know. You said trim. Oh, it's trim. trim. So I assume it's pretty thin. I don't know. Yes, 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 yes. So he should pull them all out from the back, and uh, then you just have these tiny holes, and that's how you can do it without destroying the wood. Awesome. Cool. Or just cut all the stock down to less than 18 inches and, and make boxes and stuff. Make really small pallets. Make mini furniture. Yeah. Sounds familiar. <laughs> Wait. <laughs> um, all right. Let's wrap it up with some uh, listener feedback that's come in over the wire. George writes, Several years ago, I built Matt's monster workbench. Recently, I heard Matt talk about how the boiled linseed oil he used on the bench can develop a yellow tint over time. I prefer to think of it as a golden patina. I pity the fool who calls my workbench yellow. I wish I could do a Mr. T. A pity the fool. (laughs) There we go. (laughs) Dovetails and Dados keeps it short with awesome, awesome, awesome. Thank you, Dovetails and Dados. Code Raptor writes... These guys are real people talking about real woodworking. It's refreshing, enlightening, and often humorous. And last, Michael Eck writes, Tom, this was your best episode of all time for this week. Matt and Mike, thanks for sticking with it. Appreciate what each of you do. Oh, I'm sorry. I appreciate what each of you brings to the discussion. Now, if only Ed could come back, even if for just a minute, at the end of one of your podcasts. And I think that's what we did last time. Anyway. That's it for this episode of Shop Talk Live. Tune in again in two weeks on January 15th for our next episode. In the meantime, let us know what you think by leaving a comment on iTunes. And don't forget to give us the most valuable five-star rating. If you have any woodworking questions, send them as well as your comments to shoptalk at taunton.com. That's shoptalk at taunton.com. You can catch the podcast via iTunes, stream it on your computer at www.shoptalklive.com or catch us on iHeartRadio. Thanks for listening. Happy New Year, and keep having fun in the shop. Mike wants more me time in the me shop. Time. I need a little more me time. He needs to work on me. I need some time to work on me. <laughs>